Hello, this is Michael Hannon, founder and principal consultant of Forteza Consulting. This video is about how to boost software development productivity dramatically. And by dramatically, I mean double or triple current productivity levels within a matter of weeks or months. Note that if you're already working with Agile and Scrum or extreme programming or some other method to achieve achieve more high quality work in less time, this can help you improve even from that point. And of course, if you're more embedded and comfortable with traditional software development methodologies, uh, which I still, many of which I still think work great, then these work equally well. Okay, so let's get into it and I'll explain further how I help achieve that. We're gonna be covering a single technique called the acclaimed single tasking method. Note that while I do call it a single tasking method because of how important single tasking is, it's only important to the extent that it helps us achieve task flow maximization. So we can, <clears throat> we'll be discussing how that works. If you're curious about what that picture is there, that is, as you can see, I've, I've called it a task flow diagram, uh, often referred to also as a cumulative flow diagram or CFD. And quite simply, it just says uh, how many tasks we get done over time. That's the green. And so the steeper the green slope, the more, the more productive we are as a team. And the red is, the red represents what number of tasks is ongoing at any given moment. So how many are in progress at the moment? And so in general, the thinner the red line, the better, and the steeper the green slope, the better. And again, we'll explain some of that in additional detail in the coming, coming minutes here. So first, some conceptual background. I promise I will keep this as short and sweet as I can. <clears throat> uh, but we, we cannot go very far without understanding why we're trying to apply this or that concept unless we understand what benefit that concept is here to give us. So let's start with some things that maybe not too many of us are familiar with. Many of us might be psychologists or have some background in human psychology or read some of the interesting studies on productivity and single task focus. But not many of us are likely to be familiar with the theory of constraints. So very quickly and simply, uh, without going into all the details there, theory of constraints and the broader field of human psychology teaches us that single tasking is a highly effective way to minimize lead times for humans. So <clears throat> essentially what we're talking about there is in spite of all the job announcements in project management and software development and other fields saying that multitasking is a critical skill. Uh, that may well be a critical skill in the majority of environments in today's modern work environment, but the fact of the matter is almost all of us are much less productive when we're trying to juggle multiple tasks at once, switching from one task to another. And simply by focusing on a single task through to completion, we can achieve very dramatic speed gains. And I think those of us in the software engineering field who might even be a software developer and we've been <clears throat> heavily immersed in the task at hand, uh, often the task might be somewhat complex requiring lots of focus, um, lots of ways to organize a variety of factors in our minds as we try to engineer a solution. When we can really focus in there and minimize interruptions, we describe that as being in the zone or, or achieving optimal flow, uh, th things like that. If, if, if you're familiar with any of those things, then you probably know what I'm talking about. And then uh, perhaps uh, almost as important, this notion that Speeding things up just for the sake of speeding things up doesn't really do us much good. We need to understand what's going on across our end-to-end -end process or system to know 
where the where the bottleneck is, where the weakest link is. We'll call it here the system constraint, as the theory of constraints calls it. And if we speed things up that are not the biggest bottleneck, our overall system doesn't really improve. I liken it to when you see people on the road that seem to be rushing past you um, only to arrive at the stoplight faster than you do. Uh, they haven't really achieved any reduction in time on their overall trip. And in fact, they've probably wasted a bunch of resources in fuel and repairing their brakes more frequently and things like that. So obviously we, we want to look at the system to see where speed can help us the most. Okay, so that's the concepts from TOC and psychology. In addition, we learned some interesting things from Lean and Kanban. Specifically, if you've ever heard of a Kanban method or used a Kanban board or, or learned about such things, perhaps in a Lean Six Sigma class or elsewhere, <clears throat> The first key is, especially in, in knowledge work like software engineering, visualizing what's going on, visualizing the flow, seeing where the impediments are to that flow is a critical first step before we can begin to try and improve the flow. So that makes sense. We also have this notion of pull versus push. Pull systems being much more effective, especially in environments that have variable capacity. And by that we mean we don't always know exactly how long each task might take for uh, a given individual. We don't know how long the task might take if it's assigned to different individuals. Some people are faster than others. Some people have good days and bad days. Uh, sometimes tasks are more complex than, than we imagine, or perhaps less complex. So with all those variables, to try to actually lord over that system and process and magically understand exactly what the capacity is at any given moment and optimize the flow through <clears throat> through our system very very hard to engineer as a manager uh, much much more effective is allowing the system to gauge its own readiness for the next chunk of work in the case of software development we might just say that that's as simple as a software developer finishing a task deciding when they're ready for the next task and then assigning themselves that next task uh, without waiting for the boss to realize when they're ready to set a bunch of deadlines that might be uh, overly aggressive or not aggressive enough and simply trusting the people who are closest to the work uh, to, to maximize the flow of work. So we'll get into how that operates. Some other lean concepts, one is minimizing batch sizes. Uh, again, you don't have to do extensive research on batch size reduction or single piece flow to just understand that if we can identify fine grain pieces of work and flow those through one piece at a time, we will tend to have much greater ability to maximize our flow than if we try to handle a big chunk of tasks or some task that's big and bulky and hasn't really been broken down uh, very well or specified very well. Uh, that those tend to be harder to flow through than, than the smaller pieces. And then a related concept, work in process or WIP, that simply says that if you look at any process end-to-end -end or any system, if there's a bunch of work piling up along the way at each step, or a bunch of steps are experiencing that phenomenon, you will likely see a system that is not very high performing. Uh, the flow doesn't tend to be very good in those sorts of systems. And again, there's lots of queuing theory and math and statistics behind all that, but I think sufficient for this video to say, hey, if you can look across your system, there's a whole bunch of things in the middle of being done, but somehow not really flowing to completion, the overall uh, system performance is not going to be great. So we want less whip for a fast, efficient system. And we learned some interesting things from Agile and Scrum, as well as the broader field of human psychology again here. <clears throat> In my mind, the biggest benefits of Agile and Scrum have nothing to do with sprints, nothing to do with agility, nothing to do with learning all the jargon that seems to be sort of unique and special to only the people sort of in the club who understand it. 
types of things you might learn at a certified Scrum Master class. Um, what we do care about, and we do learn from Agile and Scrum that I think is very interesting and compelling, is the speed benefits. Again, even if Agile and Scrum practitioners don't often speak in terms of speed and flow, uh, more and more they are. And many Agile Scrum teams that are beginning to apply some lean concepts, such as those described above, uh, understand what I'm talking about. So specifically, the items from Agile Scrum and, and the broader field of human psychology teach us some very interesting things about speed and flow about uh, when it comes to the team. That if you add up the individual expertise uh, and ability to be productive from each team member, that will never exceed how much we will achieve if we operate those team members as a team as opposed to individually. Note that I'm not talking about having every team member work on a piece of the same task together all the time. In fact, that might actually be a rare circumstance. <clears throat> Certainly for brainstorming and um, collaborating on how to remove impediments and resolve bottlenecks and find creative ways to improve flow across the team, that's definitely what we're talking about. But when it comes time to executing, a given task might well lend itself much better to a, a single individual going off to focus on it behind closed doors than to have five people trying to share it together. Similarly, there may well be instances where the team decides that there's a given task that lends itself well to say two people doing a paired development effort on that, on that one task uh, to achieve the flow objective desired. The second big thing from, from Agile Scrum, uh, as well as some human psychology studies that go back decades, <clears throat> is that if we actually have a disciplined framework that's designed to foster team autonomy, to trust in our ability to be more intelligent than just the boss might be on his own or her own, the motivational benefits tra translate into productivity in almost magical ways. The problem, of course, is it's sometimes hard to, measure, hard to measure the correlation between team motivation level and productivity. But I think any time any one of us has been in a highly motivated team, the, the experience is one you don't, you don't soon forget. The, the experience of being highly productive and having things flow well is very, very palpable, if, if a bit hard to measure sometimes. So, We'd like to combine all these concepts into a single method that can help us maximize flow. Key to that is knowing whether single tasking is actually happening. And one of the ways we apply all the, the concepts in the previous slide with single tasking at the center is if we use a Kanban board, or I prefer to call it a task board, I prefer them, the simpler the better. Three columns like to do, doing, and done. Uh, not that much more advanced than your average to-do list. Can uh, help focus and, and promote single tasking very effectively. And quite simply, <clears throat> if we have a team of say three people and we look at the doing column and we see six tasks being worked on, we know right away that we are not achieving single tasking. Now that average of two tasks open per, per task owner might well be far, far better than traditional environments and what, what we're often used to. But either way, the closer we can get to single tasking, the more optimal we will be with our flow. So I like to say that whatever that number is, in this case, it's six, let's just make sure but it's always just a bit lower than the number of task owners. And the reason for having it be a bit lower is that we may well find that some of our task owners get stuck from time to time and need some help getting unstuck. So we need to have some available capacity so that on occasion, two individuals can work on a task to completion as opposed to just one each. Similarly, we may again decide as a team that certain tasks lend themselves well to paired development. And so 
up front, we may decide having two people working on it together is a great idea. Uh, occasionally, we might even want more than two people to help resolve some difficult issue on a given task. So again, to engineer some kind of ratio, whether it's six to eight like I have here, or eight to 10 or something like that, each team will find its own optimum point and be able to fine tune that over time. Um, but the concept remains. So key takeaways here. This works in software development for sure, but it's not limited to just that field. As long as you can meet these four conditions, it should work well. First off, we have to have a pool of resources that can be managed as if it were a single group. It doesn't have to all report to the same boss, but we just can't have you know, the, the traditional cat herding type of exercise. We have to make sure there's a ready supply of fine-grained tasks or else people will sit idle waiting for tasks. In the case uh, of technical work, knowledge work that, that requires a lot of technical specificity like software development, that's usually a relatively easy challenge uh, because most, uh, if not all, software developers must find a way to take a somewhat large, bulky task and break it down into something they can execute in smaller pieces. So if that's already being done, then it makes it much easier to simply organize those granular tasks on a task board, for example. We just talked about, about this and why this is important. And we talked earlier about the beauties of having a pull system versus trying to push tasks on a system that may not have the capacity for it or may have excess capacity. <clears throat> and once all these are put together and done, as I mentioned on slide one, the, the, the productivity improvements tend to be pretty dramatic. And again, this, this doubling within two months, I've seen it occur within one. And this tripling I've seen uh, occur within three months. And again, I've seen this with traditional software development teams as well as Agile and Scrum teams. Uh, I will say that certainly the more effective high-performing Agile Scrum teams uh, might show less improvement. But again, given that oftentimes Agile Scrum teams are not single tasked effectively, they do allow sprint end dates and, and things to disrupt their flow. You're right in the middle of, of, of a given development effort. I think there are ways to go beyond what traditional Agile Scrum teaches us to achieve ever higher levels of, of flow. Quick example. <clears throat> Again, whether you're a profit-seeking enterprise or you work in more of a public sector environment, this works just as well under the premise that human beings are human beings and we all like to be high impact, whether it's contributing to profit or, or some other public objective. In this case, we baselined the productivity level at the yellow line and made sure that that passed the straight face test and we could, we could really convince ourselves in the, in, the, in the truth and honesty of what, what productivity level we had achieved, uh, even if it's not quite an exact science. And again, you see that yellow line curve upward slightly because we added people into the mix over time. If we had started and ended with the same number of people, that would be a flat line. In this case, we did see some struggles early on. We had some lapses in single tasking for sure. We had a variety of impediments we didn't quite know how to address immediately. And over time, some of those bumps smoothed out. Uh, we got better disciplined at uh, single tasking. Note that we, in this case, at least this quickly, we didn't quite get all the way to single tasking but we did reduce the number of open tasks from about 11 per developer to uh, less than two. And I think once we get even to that ratio of, you know, four to five or, or three to four or something like that, so fewer tasks open than the number of task owners, I think we'll see, we'll see that slope continue to steepen as we go. So with, uh, just a two month time period here, we did achieve more than double. We went back and kind of gauged it with the straight face test and found that even with some members of the group not 
fully getting with the program, not understanding the concepts, not, not quite buying into all of this. Uh, for about half the group, this became very impactful, very real, uh, very quickly. And so again, given that you might not get everyone all on board operating, you know, with all cylinders firing right away, and still achieving more than double, that's, that's pretty great. And it shows just how much more productivity is possible. So that's it for this video. If you'd like to learn more, there are some free resources that Forteza Consulting makes available. The most recent blog post is actually called Easy Speed and it's about this topic. Uh, we send out about one email a month for interesting new books that might be out there talking about these sorts of things other innovations to improve the throughput of project completions uh, and other interesting uh, goings on. Certainly some conferences and speaking events that, that I often speak at. Some of them are free and I list, uh, I list those on my website as well. This technique you've, you've gotten an overview of today is one of nine that's presented in, in, in a book we put out about a year ago. And since I'm also quite active in my local chapter of the Project Management Institute, there are some interesting resources there. Uh, one very interesting one is these uh, PM Point of View podcasts. Uh, I've been the, the, the guest speaker on a couple of them and they're, they're all, I think, very interesting uh, from a variety of innovative perspectives across, across the discipline. Uh, and oh, by the way, an upcoming, the, up, the next one out the door is uh, one on this topic as well. For those of you who'd like to learn a little bit more. Uh, I love hearing from, from people. If you have any questions on this, requests, you know, quick requests for advice. Um, I've got some tools and templates, including a checklist that might help you govern the effective use of your, your task board to achieve sort of all the conceptual goals we laid out in this, in this video, uh, all free of charge, of course, and all, uh, none of which will result in me adding you to an email list and spamming you or anything like that. Uh, more than happy to help if it's quick and easy and lend advice and encourage you on your path towards higher and higher impact. Thanks so much for listening.